Bibles with me this morning to the book of James, chapter number 2. The book of James, chapter number 2. We're going to be looking down in this chapter to verses 14 through 26. I pray the Lord will help us this morning. I want to look about in our world today. I, I'm very concerned about the brand of Christianity that is being paraded and portrayed in the national spotlight. What I'm talking about is what we often see being pictured by Hollywood performers, by Washington politicians, and even sometimes by quote unquote television preachers today. All of it under the name and the brand of Christianity and yet as I look at it, when I, see a, when I see a homosexual who's running for president get up and begin to quote scripture, it sickens my heart. When I see a, a drunk, someone who's known as an alcoholic and a drunk, who's a Hollywood performer, talk about God and how he knows God. It frightens me because I realize that there are people being influenced by what those people are saying and by the lives that they're living. And because of what they're portraying, there are others who say, well, if they're okay, I must be okay. I'm very concerned about that today. And as a result of that, we come to these verses in James chapter 2 this morning. And I'm going to preach on this thought today. Will your faith get you to heaven? Will your faith, will, will what you call your faith get you to heaven? James chapter 2, if you are physically able to stay, stand, I'll ask you to stand with me. We'll reverence the reading of God's word together. James chapter 2, verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Would you pray with me and then... We'll look at some thoughts out of these verses for a few moments. Father, thank you for being here in this place on the Lord's Day. Thank you that I woke up this morning, Lord, and I had a desire to be here. I realize that desire came from your hand, and I want to praise you for that. It's not, it's not uh, anything that I've wrought or anything that I've worked up, but it's what you've done in my heart that caused me to have a desire to be here this morning, and I thank you for that. Thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the privilege to stand and share its truth with this congregation one more time. I pray this morning you would speak to hearts in this room from the truths of these verses. 
Help us clearly to examine our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you, would you search us and try us this morning in light of the truth of God's Word and help us to respond as you speak. And we'll praise you for what you do because it is in Jesus' name that we pray and ask. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This is uh, the passage where some people believe that the Apostle James uh, contradicts the Apostle Paul. And as we read here on the surface, it would, uh, it would seem that what James is saying is contradictory to what Paul had to say in the book of Romans. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, Paul says a man is justified by faith without the deeds or the works, the deeds of the law. And yet here in James chapter 2 and verse 24, James writes, By works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Also, if you study Paul's writings in the book of Romans, you'll find that he uses Abraham as an illustration of how a person is justified by faith before God. And yet when we come here to James chapter 2, James uh, uses Abraham specifically as an illustration of how a person is justified by works. And so far what we look at is the surface here. We don't, we don't spend any time studying and comparing Scripture with Scripture. We, we, we don't rightly divide the word of truth. And there seems to be a contradiction between the two. But as we study carefully, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, we realize that in reality, James is not speaking in opposition to Paul, nor is Paul speaking in opposition to James. But in fact, what they're giving to us in the Word of God complements each other. In fact, what really is happening here is that they both are battling opposite enemies. Paul is battling those who say that you have to work to earn your salvation. You see, they had, they had that works crowd in Paul's day. They had that crowd said, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Uh, the, the Pharisees were guilty of that. And Paul is combating the works crowd. James, as he is writing, on the other hand, is battling those who... Say that you're saved, but simply because you believe in God. You just believe in God. And it really doesn't matter how you live your life. This is a classic passage showing us that, that faith which is a saving faith is always a faith which manifests itself in works. It's going to affect the way that we live our lives. If you study what Paul writes in the book of Romans, you'll find he's talking about faith in terms of how the Christian life begins. James talks about works in terms of how the Christian life is lived. What happens after we're saved. Paul talks about being justified before God. James talks about being justified before men. Paul is talking about an inward experience. James is talking about an inward experience that affects the way that we live our lives. Paul is talking about faith on the believing side. And James, on the other hand, is talking about faith on the behaving side. I believe that real faith will change your life. I believe the Word of God teaches us that your, your behavior is going to be affected, uh, determined by your belief in God and your relationship with Him. The basic thrust of what James is saying here is that genuine, real, saving, heaven-going faith always manifests itself in works in our daily lives. James is saying, show me your Christianity Give me evidence that it's real, that it's genuine. You see, beloved, a person is saved by faith alone, but a faith that saves is never going to be alone. Saving faith is always going to manifest itself through the way we live our lives. And so for a few moments this morning, I want us to look closely at this passage. 
I want us to notice the marks of a saving faith this morning. I said a little earlier in the service uh, this evening we'll be in the book of Acts chapter 2 and we'll look at the very first gospel message that was ever preached. Uh, and in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were saved. And if you study Peter's message and what happened there, you'll see, you, you'll see the ingredients of saving faith. We'll talk about that a bit in the service tonight. As I studied this week here in James chapter 2, my, my prayer, my heart's desire what was Lord help us to understand? Help me to help me to preach in a way that those who are listening will, will understand. My my desire in coming here is never to cause anybody to doubt their faith. But my desire is always to share the word of God, the, the light of the truth of God's word. And my desire is that you would let that holy light shine on your life and help you to examine where you are. What a tragedy it would be for somebody to die and go to hell off a pew in this church and not having the truth of the, heard the truth of the word of God. You see, salvation is not simply mental assent or acceptance of a Bible truth, but it is acting on that truth that brings salvation. I hear people say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. But in reality, that belief has not changed their life at all. What's wrong? What's happened there? Well, let me make three strong statements this morning out of the verses that we've read concerning saving faith and just make a statement or two about each one. Write these down. They're on the screen back there and I hope you'll write them down in your Bible. Number one is this. Saving faith... It's a matter of works as well as a matter of words. Look at verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. How many, of you, how many of you have ever heard this statement? Talk is cheap. <laughs> how many of you realize that talk is cheap? Oh, we, we've all been in that place. We, we've all had folks tell us things that ne never can. We've all had folks promise us things that, that they never d did. Well, well, I can tell you in our culture today, talk has become a, a, a very cheap thing. I, I can remember a time when a man's word was his bond. <laughs> If you've bought anything lately, you know it takes much more than a word to seal a bargain today. If you've bought a house, and I, I mean, I, the, the, Jane and I bought a house just a few years ago, and, and, and I, the man, when they came out there to close out and sign everything, I've never seen such a stack of papers in my life. And I asked the lady that was handling that, I said to her, Has, has anybody ever taken time to read every word that's there? She said, I, I'm sorry to tell you, I've had some people we had to sit here for hours as they read every word. Well, I didn't read every word. I, I just knew that they, they needed my signature and to know I was going to pay and how I was going to pay and all that sort of thing. But you know what I know this morning, that talk is cheap. And nowhere is that truer than in the Christian life when talk is not supported by walk. It's not hard to talk about knowing God. It's not hard to talk about knowing Jesus Christ. It's not hard to talk a religious game but listen to me, when that talk is not backed up by walk in your life, then people around you have a real reason to doubt the reality of your faith. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ will not only affect a person's vocabulary, but it will also affect their vocation, their works, the deeds of their life. James says here in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? What James is saying is that a faith that does not manifest itself in work is not the right kind of faith. It's not the kind of faith that brings about salvation in a person's life. 
The key word in, in the, those uh, few verses that I, that I just read uh, is, is the word say. Verse 14, though a man say he hath faith. Verse 16, one of you say unto them. Verse 18, uh, he says, yea, a man say. He's talking about a person who makes a profession of faith and yet his or her daily living, the activities of their life, the deeds, the works of their life do not demonstrate a real, genuine faith in God. Verses 15 and 16. James uses a very helpful illustration to get us to see the point here. And what he's saying in those verses is this. Someone comes to you that you know really well. They're, they're destitute. In fact, he says they're naked and they have no food. They come to your house late in the evening seeking help. And no doubt when you answer the knock on the door, you're greatly surprised to see them standing there. You're, you're just overwhelmed and you ask them the question, what in the world has happened to you? And they, they explain the condition as well as they can. And then they, they ask you if you can spare some clothes to cover their nakedness and some food to quench their hunger. Now, now suppose in response to, to that request, everything you've seen, everything you have heard, you say to them something like this. Well, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God will supply some clothing to cover your nakedness. And I'm going to pray that God will supply some food to quench your hunger. I know the Lord is going to take care of you. And then you simply close the door and go back into your house carrying on your life as you were before that knock came. Now here's the question. What good is that? Uh, what, what good are those words going to do those people? Be you filled? Be you clothed? What good are those words going to do them? Really, all of that is nothing more than hypocrisy in a person's life. Now, now the words may sound real religious, but, 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 but words can't fill a hungry stomach and, and words can't clothe a naked body. So what James is saying here is that it's not enough just to say things. You've got to demonstrate the reality of those things by the deeds you do, by the life you live. It's easy to sing, oh, how I love Jesus. But you see, if salvation is real in your life, saying those words are not going to be enough. You're going to invest your life in proving the reality of that statement. And so what James is saying here, it's not enough to just say things. You've got to demonstrate the reality of those things by the deeds you do. Turn over just a page or two to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18. The apostle John is writing and he says this, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now I realize this morning we, we, live in, we live in a day and an hour when there's a con man just about on every corner. Uh, every day as I drive around over this city, I, I see them, I, I see them stand, and, and, and please forgive me, I, I'm not saying that they're all like this, but, but when you see the same guy standing on the same corner or another corner, and you know it's the same person you've seen over and over again, hungry need food, hungry need food, or they're standing there with a guitar in their hands and begging for money, same, day after day, week after week, and I don't have to drive a block until I see a, a, a sign that's says help wanted after a while if you're not careful you get very skeptical of those kinds of things that's not what he's talking about here what he's talking about here is the life of a child of God and they see someone who is indeed, indeed in need you know they're in need and you have the ability to help supply some of that need, maybe not all of it, but something to do to give them a little bit of comfort, and you turn away, and you just say to them, I'm going to pray God will fill your stomach, and God will clothe your back. Well, what good will those words do? So James is trying to make the point that saving faith 
It's not merely a matter of words. It's also a matter of works. What he's saying is this. Demonstrate the reality of your faith, not merely by words you say, but by the deeds of your life. Saving faith is a matter of works as well as words. Look, look at verse number 17 here in James chapter 2. Even so, if it hath not works, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Do you think the Apostle Paul would agree with that statement? There are those who say Paul and James are in total conflict with each other here. Do you think Paul would agree with that? What, do, you, do you think he would say, Men, even so faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone? Well, listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. He's talking about a changed lifestyle. Listen to what he said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Here's the question this morning. Is your faith the saving kind? Will it get you to heaven? James is telling us here that saving faith is a matter of works as well as a matter of words. Number two, he says to us in these verses that not only is saving faith a matter of works as well as words, but saving faith is the matter of the heart as well as the head. Look at verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou, O vain man, that faith, but, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by, by works uh, uh, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? It is a fact that saving faith is a matter of the intellect. Coming to Christ does, does not mean that you've got to assassinate your brain. Uh, I, uh, what, what he's talking about here uh, is a difference between going to Disneyland and believing in Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Now, you've got to set your brain aside for a while with your kids to play fantasy in, in order to do that. Uh, he's not talking about sitting down in front of your television set and, and watching pro wrestling. You, if you're going to believe that stuff, you've got to set your brain aside for a while. <laughs> Hello? Huh? He's not saying at, 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 the, at, the, at, at the point in time of your salvation that you've got to set aside rational thinking. In, in fact, I, if you look at, at it closely, you'll find that the most rational position in all this world is the position of that person who puts his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing more rational in this world than that of trusting Jesus Christ. The Christian faith is intellectually credible thinking people do get saved that's what James is talking about in verse 19 look, look, look at it thou believest that there is one God thou doest well he said it's a wonderful thing to believe in God that's good that's good a person who's rational is going to believe that there is a God how in the world could you deny that there is a God I heard about this atheist too was mocking a very devout Quaker. And he said to the Quaker, have you ever seen God? The Quaker said, no, I, I haven't. The atheist said, well, have you ever felt God? And the Quaker thought for a minute and he said, no, I, I don't think I've ever felt God. And the atheist said, well, have you ever smelled God? And the Quaker said, no, I don't, I don't think I've ever smelled God. And then the atheist said, then, well, how do you know that there's a God? You've never, you, you've never seen him, you've never felt him, you've never smelled him. How, how in the world do, do, can you believe that there's a God? And the Quaker said, let me ask you this. Dost thee ever see thy brain? And the atheist thought for a moment and said, no, no I don't think so. And the Quaker said, didst thou ever feel thy brain? 
And the Quaker said, no, I, I can't say that I've ever felt my brain. And he said, didst thou ever smell thy brain? <laughs> and the atheist said, no, I don't think I ever smelt my brain. Well then, said the Quaker, how then dost thou know thou hast a brain? <laughs> Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. A man who believes in God, that, that is good thinking. But notice the latter part of this verse. James goes a step further and he says, The devils, the demons also believe and tremble. They believe in God. Not only do they believe in God, but they're moved. They're moved as a result of their belief. They tremble. That word tremble means to shudder. It means to be disturbed by the thought that, that there is a God. It's amazing as you study the New Testament to find out some of the things that the demons believe. Mark chapter 5, the demons in the Gadarean demoniac that Jesus healed confessed that Jesus was the son of the most high God. Think about that. Demons believe that. Mark chapter 1 tells us the demon and the, and the man that Jesus delivered confessed Jesus as the Holy One of God. In fact, if you'll study the New Testament, you'll find that, that the demons believe there's a coming judgment and that there is a hell. That, that, that's something that a lot, a lot of even quote-unquote religious people like Joel Osteen don't even believe. They're smarter than he is. The one thing that a demon will never do is confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of his life. What I'm trying to emphasize here is the fact that you can be doctrinally right. You can believe the right things. You, you can have all those things lined up correctly. You can believe that there is a God. You can believe that Jesus Christ came into this world and yet still go straight to hell. Salvation is a matter of the heart as well as the head. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto, the, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. As the old preacher years ago I, I heard say, I, I fear that there are a lot of folks who are going to miss heaven by about 18 inches. They got all the thinking right, but it never had an effect on their heart. You see, saving faith is not merely a matter of intellectual belief, but saving faith is a commitment to what the Word of God has to say. You heard this illustration before, but it fits so well here. About the tightrope walker who had uh, strung a, a, a tight cable across uh, the Niagara River just above the falls. A crowd had gathered around to watch what he was doing, and he, uh, he asked that crowd, how many of you believe I can walk across the river on this tightrope? And uh, everybody said, yes, we believe you can. And he walked across the river and, and back. Then he got a wheelbarrow. And he said, how many of you believe I can roll this wheelbarrow across this tightrope and back? And all they, again, they, they said yes. And again, uh, he took that wheelbarrow and walked across that river and back. When he got back to the other side where the people were assembled, he said, now how many of you believe I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and push him across and back? And again, the people applauded. Oh, yes, yes, we, we believe you can do that. And he looked over the young man standing close to him and he said, son, how about you being the first one? And the little boy looked at him carefully and turned, turned, turned aside and ran for his life. You see, he believed in his head, but he didn't believe in his heart. Do you have saving faith? I mean, have you committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Look at verse 20 again. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? What he's saying is this, real faith, committed faith, faith that is exercised in Jesus Christ is going to affect the way you live. Faith is a matter of works as well as words. It's a matter of heart as well as the head. And then lastly, in the latter part of, of this chapter, uh, James talks about saving faith being public as well as private. And he uses two illustrations to close out what he's teaching here to make his point. And what he's basically saying here is if you've indeed trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you're going to be willing to make some outward public confession of that faith in Christ. He uses Abraham, first of all, in his illustration, verses 21 through 24. 
he, he's using the same scripture here that Paul used back in Romans chapter 4 concerning Abraham. Look at verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. The reference he's making, uh, the reference that Paul made is to uh, what happened in Genesis chapter 15. God had promised Abraham that he would bless the world through his seed. As we come to Genesis 15, that promise has not been fulfilled. Abraham is now an older man. And he raises the question with God, Lord, Lord I'm still childless. What, what wilt thou give me? And God said to him again, Abraham, look toward the heavens. Look at the stars. Can you number the stars? And Abraham said, no, God, I can't number all the stars in the sky. And the Lord responds, Abraham, your seed will be as numerous as those stars in the sky. And then the, the Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it was, it was counted. That word counted there is the word imputed. In other words, uh, God is placing this to his, his account. God counted, uh, it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham in his own heart, in the privacy of his own soul, was justified by faith before God. It was a deeply personal, deeply private thing as he, as he believed what God said to him. But you'll notice in the illustration that James uses here that he, that he adds another experience. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? He moves now from Genesis 15 to Genesis 22. In verse 23, he takes us to Genesis 15, Genesis 15. And then in verse 21, he takes us to Genesis 22. The, the reference in verse 21 is to that time in obedience to God's command that Abraham laid his only son Isaac on the altar and by so doing, he was indicating his total confidence in God, that he believed God was going to do what he promised to do for him. What's happening here, his works are demonstrating the reality of his faith. Look at verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was made perfect. Here's the point. Abraham proved the reality of what took place in private by the testimony uh, in public. When he had laid his only son on the altar, the entire world could see that he indeed had trusted God. In other words, in Genesis 15, he said it. And now in Genesis chapter 22, he showed it. In Genesis, Genesis 15, he was justified by faith before God. In Genesis 22, he was justified by works before man. In Genesis 15, he believed it, but in Genesis 22, he behaved it. He proved that what was on the inside was real, by what he did on the outside. Now then James moves on to another, uh, another illustration. He moves to the opposite end of the spectrum from Abraham the patriarch to Rahab the prostitute. He begins with a Jew and he moves to the Gentile. Verses 25 and 26. Likewise was also not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so without works is dead also. The reference here is to Joshua chapter 2. Talking about the time when the spies of Israel came into the city of Jericho to spy it out. And when they arrived, they made an, uh, an amazing discovery. You, you can imagine as they uh, it just so happened, the very first person they encountered in Jericho was a believer by the name of Rahab, a woman who had been involved in an age-old age old profession, the age of, of harlotry. Who would have ever believed that they'd find a believer in this wicked city of Jericho, and especially that she would be a, a woman who had been a prostitute. And yet when they get there, Rahab said to them, we've heard about your God. We've heard about your God. And she refers to the experience of Israel at the Red Sea. 
Now think about this. I, just stop. You know, we, we, we've got uh, 66 books in our Bibles. Uh, somebody said 900 pages. I don't know, depending on what translation, you, I mean, not translation, but what, uh, what uh, Bible you have with references and everything, the number of pages, but 66 books in your Bible. Rahab just had one little statement. We've heard about your God. She didn't have the Bible to read. She didn't have a preacher to stand up and preach as I've stand, tried to stand and preach before you this morning. All she had heard was what she'd been told by, by the other Gentiles around her, by, by, by these uh, inhabitants of the city of Jericho. And they had heard how Israel had escaped Pharaoh, how they'd walked through the Red Sea, how God had delivered them from all of that. What a small portion of the Bible she had just that one little account of Israel crossing the Red Sea, and yet she acted on what she heard. What that tells us is that somewhere in the privacy of her own soul, this poor sinful woman was justified by faith before God. But now, James says that when the spies came, that she quickly hid those spies at great risk to herself and to her family, and then she was willing to put the scarlet thread out her window as the army of Israel came against the city for the entire world to see. And James says that she was justified by her works publicly. And again, that says to us, if your faith is real, if it's a saving kind of faith, if it'll be a public matter as well as a private matter. The Lord didn't call us to be in the secret service. <laughs> he called us to be open Christians in this world. You may not know every verse of Scripture that somebody else you know knows, but if you're saved this morning, the Spirit of God lives and abides within you, and day by day He's instructing you in how you ought to live. And the way you live is going to influence the lives of other people. Miss Janet and I were sitting the other morning Early, oh, and, and, I, and I, I'm talking early. We're talking 7 o'clock, and uh, we were sitting at uh, Chick-fil-A. And uh, as we normally do, we sat down with breakfast in, in the back, and as we always do, we bowed our heads and prayed. When I, when I lifted my eyes, I saw a young man. I saw him when he came in. I'm always observant. And I go in places today with all this mess going on. You want to know who kind of who's around you today, so if you need to take cover, you can. And I saw this young fellow, and when I, when I, when I raised my eyes up, I, I couldn't help but notice that he was looking directly at us. He got up out of his seat. He, came all, he was sitting up at the front of the restaurant. He came all the way to the back table where we were sitting. And he broke out in a smile about the time he got to our table. Because I didn't know, I thought, what, what, what's, I, well, being a preacher, you get used to people hitting you up for a meal <laughs> wherever you go. And I thought he was going to ask me to buy his breakfast, and I, and I would have, but... Uh, he said, I just want to come back here and tell you how it blessed my heart to see two people bow their head and pray over their breakfast. You just don't see that anymore. Listen to me. The way you live is going to have an effect on others that are around you. A, a, a real faith, I'm talking about a real faith, is going to affect your life. Notice how James closes what he's saying here. For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead also. What he's saying here is if there's no breath in the body, then it's a dead body. You see, the way you know a body is still alive is there going to be breath. <laughs> Watch one of these old-time westerns, you know, and, and uh, some, somebody says he's shot. I don't, I don't think he's alive. Now get a little feather and put it up in front of his nostrils to see if there's any air coming at, in or out. If there's no breath then all you've got is a shell, a corpse. What breath is to a body, so works is to faith. If your faith has no works, it's a shell, it's a sham, it's not the real kind. The Bible kind of faith changes our lives. Now here's the question that James is presenting. Will your faith get you to heaven? In that great passage in John chapter 10 where Jesus proclaims himself as the door to heaven, he says that anyone who entereth not by the door but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. 
I said as I started this morning, my purpose this morning in preaching this message is not to cause anybody to doubt their faith. My, my purpose this morning is to expose the truth of God's word so the Holy Spirit could deal with your heart and bring you to a place to examine your faith, what you call your faith. I'm going to heaven when I die. I hope you know you're going to heaven when you die. But if you're going to heaven when you die, it's not just going to be because you believe there is a God. Even the demons do that. It's not going to be that you believe in a historical person called Jesus Christ. The demons know that to be reality. But if you go to heaven when you die, it's going to be because those truths have affected your heart. They've changed your life. They've made you a different person in this world. Real faith, true faith, is the only faith it will do. Will your faith get you to heaven? William Booth said this, Faith and works should travel side by side, step answering to step, like the legs of men walking. First faith and then works, and then faith again and then works again, until they can scarcely distinguish which is the one and which is the other. It's not so much what I say if the way I live does not back it up. It's living faith, living reality, that men can see Jesus in our lives. Would you bow your head with me, please? Our heads are bowed, and eyes are closed for a moment this morning. Our ladies are coming the piano and the organ this morning. The question is simply this. Will your faith get you to heaven?